This week we are going to talk about the chicken inequalities and about the computation of uh, eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors in uh, Cayley graphs. Um, one theorem that we proved in the first week of class was that the number of times that zero appears as an eigenvalue in the spectrum of the Laplacian matrix of a graph is precisely the same as the number of uh, connected components of the graph. So the second smallest second value of the Laplacian is zero if and only if the graph is disconnected, which happens if and only if the expansion itself is zero. So the expansion is zero if and only if the second smallest second value is zero. And the Chigger inequalities are a stronger version of this fact. They show that the expansion of a graph and the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian, they are approximations of each other. This has three main uh, implications. One is that because the proof is constructive, this theorem actually gives the analysis of uh, an approximation algorithm for uh, computing the um, expansion of a graph. It's an algorithm that was known and used even before this theorem was proved, but this theorem gives a worst case analysis of the performance of this algorithm. Another application is that if we want to construct a family of uh, expanders, what we need to prove is that the expansion of the graphs in a family is bounded from below by a fixed constant. And because of the Chigger inequalities, in order to prove that, it's enough to prove that the second smallest second value of the Laplacian matrices of the graphs in the family is bounded below by a constant. And usually it's easier to reason about the eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix rather than trying to reason about the expansion directly. The third application relates to the estimate of uh, the mixing time of uh, random walks in graphs. We will see that an upper bound to the time that it takes for a random walk in a graph to reach the stationary distribution is 1 divided by lambda 2 times log n, where lambda 2 is the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian of the graph. Because of the Chigger inequalities, this upper bound can also be written as 1 divided did by the conductance squared of the graph times log n. And although usually it's easier to reason about the spectrum of a graph than to reason about the expansion of the conductance, there are some graphs where the conductance is actually easier to reason about. And so through the Chigger inequalities, one can bound mixing time of random walks by bounds on the expansion. The second part of this lecture will be about computing eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors of uh, Cayley graphs. Cayley graphs are graphs defined in terms of uh, equations over groups and they include um, cycles, grids, hypercubes, cliques, and uh, several other interesting families of graphs. We will compute explicitly the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of uh, all those graphs, and those will also give us tight examples for all the claims that we will prove in the Chigger inequality. The Chigger inequalities are a relationship between uh, the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian of a graph and the expansion of the graph. So if G is a graph, L is its Laplacian matrix, and lambda 1 up to lambda n are the eigenvalues of uh, L sorted in uh, increasing order and counting multiplicities. Then something that we proved in the last lecture was that the kth smallest eigenvalue is 0 if and only if G has K or more connected components. So in particular, lambda 2 is 0 if and only if G is disconnected. And G is disconnected if and only if the expansion of the graph is 0. So the expansion is 0 if and only if lambda 2 is 0. The Chigger inequalities, they provide a um, stronger connection between uh, lambda 2 and the expansion. And they give us that the expansion is at least half of lambda 2. So in every graph where lambda 2 is large, the expansion must be large. And the expansion is at most the square root of uh, 2 times lambda 2. So in every graph where lambda 2 is small, the expansion also has to be small. There is a quadratic loss in this inequality. And as we will prove later, this quadratic loss is tight for uh, some graphs. So we're going to begin by proving the easier direction, the one showing that the expansion is at least half of uh, lambda 2. 
And in order to prove this inequality, we're going to introduce one more um, concept, which is that of the sparsity of um, a cut in a graph. So if S is a subset of vertices of a graph, the sparsity of S is the number of edges that leave S, so they go from S to the complement of S, divided by the total number of uh, pairs of vertices that are uh, separated or they become unreachable if uh, these edges are removed. And uh, this is just a normalizing factor that makes uh, the minimum of this quantity over all sets always at most one. If uh, this is the set of vertices of a graph and uh, this is a cut, so here we are looking at the total number of edges that cross this cut and we divide it by the total number of uh, pairs of vertices unreachable from each other if uh, this set of uh, edges gets removed. And the meaning of uh, this normalizing factor is that what we're going to look at will not just be the number of crossing edges divided by the number of pairs of vertices, but the fraction of total edges which are crossing, so this is the crossing edges, and let's say we divide by the total number of edges. In a d-regular graph, the total number of edges is dn over 2. And then in the denominator, instead of looking at the total number of pairs of vertices that become disconnected if this number of edges is removed, we're going to look at what fraction of uh, all the pairs of vertices become unreachable. So these many pairs of vertices become uh, unreachable, and we normalize by the total number of uh, pairs of vertices, which is n choose 2, which we approximate by n squared over 2. So when we simplify this expression, this is what we end up with, where n is the number of vertices. So this is the sparsity of uh, a set of vertices. The sparsity of uh, a whole graph will be the minimum sparsity over all sets, except those for which the denominator would be a division by 0. And also, remember the way we define the expansion of a set of vertices to be just the number of crossing edges, uh, but divided by the volume of S, or D times the size of S in a regular graph. An expansion of a graph is the minimum over all cuts S as complement, where S is smaller than S complement, so where S contains at most half of uh, all the vertices. Given these definitions, it is not hard to see that the expansion of a graph is at most the sparsity of the graph, which is at most uh, twice the expansion of the graph. Because first of all, here, in a definition of the sparsity of a graph, since the sparsity of S and the sparsity of V minus S are the same, this minimization will not change if we just minimize over sets of vertices whose size is at most half of the total number of vertices. Because for every solution here of size more than half of the vertices, the cost will be the same as the cost of uh, V minus S, which will uh, satisfy this condition. And now if we compare the cost function in uh, the case of uh, sigma and in the case of phi, they differ by v minus s divided by v, which is um, for s less than half the number of vertices, it's a factor that is between half and one. And so we have this inequality. Now the fact that we have this inequality means that if we want to prove that lambda 2 is at most twice the expansion, it's enough to prove that lambda 2 is at most uh, the sparsity of the graph which is what we're going to do next. So we have established that the sparsity of a graph is at most uh, twice the expansion, and that the sparsity is the minimum over all uh, sets of vertices, which we may equivalently represent as Boolean vectors, of uh, the number of edges with one endpoint in a set and one endpoint in the other, which can be written in this way if uh, x is the indicator vector of a set divided by the total number of uh, pairs of vertices that are separated by the cut, which again we can write in this way if the set S is represented as a Boolean vector. And now notice the similarity between the characterization of uh, the second smallest eigenvalue of um, a regular graph that comes from the variational characterization of uh, eigenvalues as the minimum over all uh, real vectors orthogonal to the eigenvector of the smallest eigenvalue, which is always the all-one vector, 
of uh, the um, really quotient x transpose Laplacian x divided by x transpose x, which, as we proved in the first lecture, can also be rewritten in uh, this way. Now, there are some differences between those two expressions, but we will still be able to show that lambda 2 is at most sigma, and so this will follow that lambda 2 is at most uh, twice the expansion. So those are the expressions for the sparsity and for um, lambda 2. And we just need to make a couple of observations. The first is that in uh, for vectors x that are orthogonal to the all one vector, the denominator of the Rayleigh quotient, where there is this summation of uh, xv squared, can also be equivalently rewritten as 1 over n times summation over all uh, unordered pairs of vertices of uh, xu minus xv squared. That's because if we expand uh, this square, what we will get is uh, 1 over n times uh, the summation over all uh, unordered pairs of uh, x u square plus uh, x v square minus 2 over n times uh, the summation over all uh, unordered pairs of uh, x u times x v. Now this part of the expression will just be summation over the vertices of uh, x v square because every vertex will appear n times in uh, this summation, and so divide by n. This part can be rewritten as 1 over n times the summation over ordered pairs uv of uh, x u x v. But that's just uh, 1 over n times uh, summation over v of uh, x v, all squared. The fact that x is orthogonal to the whole one vector means that this summation is 0, so this whole expression is 0. And so 1 over n times summation over unordered pairs uv of x u minus x v squared is just this part of the expression that, as we said before, is just the summation of the x v's. So the denominators here and here are the same. Another observation is that when we have Boolean vectors, those differences x u minus x v they are themselves boolean. And so if we square them, we don't change their value because 0 squared is 0 and 1 squared is 1. Finally, an expression like summation over uv of uh, xu minus xv is invariant to adding some fixed constant to every coordinate of a vector. And so we can say that lambda 2 is equal to the minimum over all uh, vectors x of this expression. That's because by this observation, this is certainly the same as optimizing over all vectors orthogonal to the all one vector, uh, this expression, because the numerator is the same and we proved that the denominator, the denominator is the same. But for every arbitrary vector x, not necessarily orthogonal to the all ones, we can always construct a vector orthogonal to all ones that has the same cost function just by subtracting the average value of uh, the entries of the vector from uh, every entry. So then we will get a vector for which all those differences are the same and such a summation of the entries is zero. So we might uh, omit this restriction in the optimization and uh, not change the value of the optimum. And here this is equal to sigma of g because it's the same expression that we have here except that we have squared all the differences which we can do because the differences are boolean. So having written sigma in this way and lambda in this way, now we see that sigma is bigger than lambda because it's uh, the same cost function but here optimized over all boolean vectors, here optimized over all uh, real vectors and so this is smaller because it's a minimum of the same cost function over a um, bigger set of possibilities. Another way of uh, saying it is that we have established that lambda 2 is a relaxation of uh, sigma.